Dr. Andrew Herself. I'm the academic director of the Museum, Lamb Museum of Anthropology. And I'm so excited that you all came to join us here on Indigenous People's Day. Uh, before we begin, uh, I'd like to start our museum events, and especially on Indigenous People's Day, uh, by acknowledging that the Lamb Museum of Anthropology stands on the ancestral and unceded land of the Kiawe, Tupelo, and Sasoni peoples. In addition to that, uh, this land, of course, served as a meeting ground, a uh, land of exchange uh, for the Sahara, Catawba, Cherokee, and Lumbee tribes for generations. And certainly, today, this land is still the home to many indigenous peoples as well who choose to live here. So please join me uh, for a brief moment of recognizing the indigenous peoples of this land past and present. Thank you. Our speaker tonight is Mr. David Anderson. Uh, Mr. Anderson is a horticulture operations supervisor for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Um, he uh, got his degree in horticultural science with a minor in crop science and an emphasis in soil science from the NC State University. He worked briefly in Wyoming at the USDA, as I just learned on a lot over here. Um, but after a, 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 maybe about two years, it seems like, two year stint out in Wyoming, he moved back to uh, to North Carolina so that he could take uh, a job at the newly developed Division of Agricultural and Natural Resources. He currently lives in the Big Cove community of Cherokee, and he operates a farm there, which, again, some internet sleuthing, is that, um, <laughs> is that Mission Valley Farm? No, it's the Palms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see, this is why, you know, internet sleuthing, doing your own research, doesn't work out very well. Uh, but I do know from the research he kind of provided me that he is also, in addition to his interests in horticulture and agriculture, he also plays stickball for the Birdtown community and is the co the football coach at Cherokee High School. And I have here a note, it's in all caps, it says, Go Braves! <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Mr. Anderson. Thank you. Joe, the Adal, the lead DC Sequoia. Um, as you already mentioned, I'm David Anderson uh, from the Kuala Boundary. Um, I'm the Horticulture Operations Supervisor for the Eastern Band. And uh, thank you guys for having me here. It's been a long time since I've been to Wake Forest. I, uh, I spent some time at the Children's Hospital when I was young, and so it's, it's good to be back on different terms. But, uh, beautiful campus. It's always great to get into what I call the flatlands a little bit. This is flat to me. So, <laughs> Um, today, we're going to talk about, really, I guess, I told you, Tina, putting the culture back in agriculture. And, you know, we'll get there here in a second, but um, we call it revitalizing Cherokee culture with significant plants. And uh, these things have been around for thousands of years, but uh, we've seen drop-offs, and I'm speaking to you guys specifically as a tribal employee who works in this field, and my job is to work with work with our enrolled members and to try to bring these populations and knowledge back to life so seven generations from now they'll know what we know. Sorry, you already knew that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, kind of starting out, the Center for Cherokee Plants was an operation started in 2007 by Mr. Kevin Welch. Kevin is a member from the enrolled member from the Big Cove community as well, and uh, he had this idea that there was too many elders dying, there was too much knowledge lost, there was we were getting away from who we were as Gadoogie as people, and that the community aspect of Cherokee was dying, and that the foods that connected us, if we brought them back, that it brought the social impact back, that language would revitalize. Um, culture would revitalize, um, community standing would revitalize, all these things would happen. And so I always have to give Kevin credit uh, for the work that he did because Kevin pretty much volunteered to do this uh, for a long time. And uh, uh, Kevin's no longer, he's not dead, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say he's no longer with us. <laughs> yeah, Kevin lives in Alaska now, which, what a change in the mountains. But um, here's a short little article. Uh, there, you can pull up about Kevin and his work this time. But uh, Kevin went community to community, house to house. He went all the way to Oklahoma. He traded things with Cherokees in Oklahoma. He brought things back. He gave them things. 
Um, he just did some really incredible work, and I, I can't thank him enough for kind of sparking uh, Cherokee agriculture to where it is today. And um, I don't harp a whole lot about the past. You'll hear me talk about things um, from the past that play into today's present. But um, uh, this is a, a certainly not that long ago, but certainly important. And um, i got to give Dr. David Kozo credit. If anybody's ever heard of Dave Kozo, he was the director of RT Car, which is the revitalization of traditional Cherokee artisan resources. And uh, Dr. Kozo did a ton of work with Kevin. Um, he was the River Cane guru, and anybody from the Southeast that's an indigenous person recognizes how important River Cane uh, is to indigenous peoples. So, so can you, you can have that to plant down there, by the way. Uh, I'm a very interactive person, so we're going to talk and ask questions as we go, and I'm going to hand stuff around. Uh, but this is a this is my fish basket, uh, river cane fish basket, uh, that a friend of mine made for me. I helped her harvest the cane, and I just died with blood root. Uh, but when I was a boy, you'd see a fish basket hanging on about everybody's porch. And I always wanted a fish basket to hang on my porch. <laughs> that was my gift. That's an Eric Wigger, um, some of the cane I harvested with him. And then I have to give a shout out to Dr. Vedito too. He works at Western Carolina University, and uh, he uh, he did his thesis in the Cherokee plants, and um, he documented a lot of things, with a lot of interviews as well. So I always have to give them guys credit because we wouldn't be where we were at without them. And uh, Kevin here, where he's standing, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Is an area known as Gadua. And has anybody ever heard of Gadua? So this is right outside of. Cherokee going back towards Bryson City, and um, Gadua is the mother town of all Cherokees. That is the first village site, that is the first um, sort of plan system was come up with. That's that's the oldest occupied place that they can ever trace Cherokee people back to is right there. And we're really, really lucky to have uh, bought that property back for the third time in 1997. There was a golf course plan for it. But uh, now it's preserved completely as uh, cultural use and farmland. But um, uh, that's where Kevin started at. And so my program, the Horticulture Office, is, is less than four years old. Um, it was previously a watershed restoration program, and it started in 2013, and it was done through Brownfields, EPA money, and basically what that happened was the tribe did a feasibility study and determined that they were spending too much money buying plants from people when they wanted to do it themselves. And so we built this wonderful facility on uh, Goose Creek, if anybody's familiar with Goose Creek area and Cherry Pea. Uh, but since then, we've expanded into vegetables, fruits, ornamentals, native cultural plants, um, traditional foods, we have an apiary. We do a lot of seed production. We do education, but we also do a lot of services to our growers. Um, we have shared use equipment. Uh, if we have an empty space in the greenhouses, we let our tribal farmers come in, grow out transplants, um, anything along those lines. And I mean, the idea was to encompass Cherokee stewardship and practices. And because we started as a native plant and greenhouse facility, that's always going to be a part of it. And um, I think that it kind of gets left behind sometimes is that we farm native plants the same way we farm in the field. Um, we burn the woods. We would go out and manage uh, chestnut groves and pawpaw groves and blackberries, raspberries. And so uh, that gets, that's kind of a concept that's starting to come back. You hear it a lot as a forest farming or um, permaculture or a lot of buzzwords. But you know, those things were just common common practice the Cherokees historically in agriculture. And so today, uh, this is like basically what my facility consists of. It's a 36 by, 20, a 36 by 60 greenhouse. We have a cold frame that's 30 by 96, a high tunnel that's 30 by 72. Uh, we have a two and a half acre nursery grow yard, three acres for field production, 30 raised beds, and eight mini cold frames. Um, we do 50 plus species at any time, uh, typically 55,000 plants are on the property at any time. And those could be going to forestry, they could be going to watershed, they could be going to an artisan 
type of planting. They could go to um, a wildlife. It's very important as well. We work with those guys a lot. And um, we have a short-term seed bank on the property as well. We have one at the North Carolina Arboretum. That's our long-term for climate change. Uh, we've had a memorandum of agreement with the Arboretum for several years. And so we, uh, we've done several, several projects over there. Um, and we're expanding. We're, we're, we're fixing to have an absolute facelift this winter at the facility. New structures going up, um, upgrades going up, new equipment, new buildings. And so this is something that has been a very successful uh, project for the tribe. Um, so let's kind of, let's see, I guess I can look at If you look up in the top left middle, those are some of the raised beds. Now typically don't grow produce in those. Uh, right now they have wild potatoes in them, they have ginseng in them, uh, they have ramps in them, they have uh, anything that's kind of hard to dig out of native soil, like grow in the raised beds for seed or to give away. We do several giveaways a year. We just did ginseng last week. We do ramps in the spring. But um, the reason I put that picture up is because that year I just put those beds in and uh, I filled them up, but that's our speakers council. And so those folks work for our speakers, uh, or our language learning academy. And so these are first language learners who only grew up speaking Cherokee, uh, but they come down, they have to come down to the facility and uh, they have to do their lessons. They want to be outside and they can pick, but they bring the kids down and they can do some of their language lessons of what is a pepper, I mean, you know. Uh, so that's a, that, that picture always kind of melts my heart because they love free produce. <laughs> Who doesn't? But uh, that's the entrance design to our facility, um, named after Mrs. Jessie Al, who was a resident of Cooper Creek, maybe 500 yards away. She farmed there, lived there, and uh, we, we did that in honor of her. Uh, the bottom left is a picture of our uh, apiary. Um, we manage anywhere from 10 to 20 hives on the property a year. We Our goal is, uh, they're, they're mainly educational, really. And honeybees are non-native. They're not, it's not that they're not important, but they are non-native. And so I put that up there because it always sparks my mind to think that we do a lot of pollinator work. We've been doing a lot of monarch plantings. Um, we monitor for the rusty patch bumblebee, which one of the last sightings in North Carolina was, was close to us. And so since we're on tribal trust land, which is federal, we have an obligation ourselves to monitor for those things. So we do our part in restoring habitat and making sure populations are okay. Down in the bottom middle, you can see uh, some of the nursery that looks to be someone getting wet with a sprinkler. Uh, <laughs> that's probably button bush, some alder, and probably some hazel, um, most likely. Uh, this is a picture of our main greenhouse here. Um, we went all out, we probably didn't need the structure, but uh, we had the money, so it's a Van Wingerton style, and uh, everything that we do starts in that house, though. It's our head house, everything starts from there, and it's brought out into the field. I have a question, David. Yeah. Is this something that is open to the general public, yes. or is it just a travel member? It's open to the general public, and so I should have said that, but um, we're open every day from 7.45 to 4.30, Monday through Friday. Uh, when it comes to native and culturally significant plants, we don't sell those. Um, we will give those to tribal enrolled members only. We will never charge our people for something that's culturally significant to them. Uh, but we do have a obligation to also generate revenue for the tribe and to at least pay for our program. So we do sell blueberries, apples, vegetable transplants, um, things along those lines. We do a lot of flame azaleas. People like to come get them. Mm -hmm. And um, so the money goes back into the program at the very least. Some of the plants that we produce, um, these are just some of the ones that come to my mind as I was going through that we, we actively grow out for projects or for cultural resources. Does anyone know what prairie willow is? I won't go deep into it, but it's arguably the most important ceremonial plant to Cherokees. Um, it's becoming a little less common, 
it's it's not very common in Oklahoma, and it's virtually went extinct in Oklahoma from people over harvesting. And so mm -hmm. now they're coming east, they're regaining some of that. And so um, that's one of those ones when I community survey, I listen to what they're saying and what they're looking for, and I will grow it and give it back to people. And <laughs> we don't really advertise it. Um, our ceremonial tobacco, uh, Nicotina Ristia, um that's a great one. Has anybody ever seen our traditional tobacco? Mm -hmm. God, I don't know if you ever smoked it or not, but it's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Ten times the nicotine content. Uh, wow, well, dramatic layer. River cane, uh, Rudinaria jacantia, uh, arguably one of our most important uh, traditional plants. River cane is, I think, 2% or 3% of what it was at one time population-wise. That's less than a percent on tribal lands. And as you just saw, that as baskets I passed around, um, you see why that plant's so important. But it also provided uh, habitat for a lot of uh, uh, wildlife and birds and uh, uh, reptiles, things of those nature. We used to have a parakeet that was native that lived in that river cane. Um, break and uh, they've gone extinct. Um, there was a cane rattler. So as that as that plant's declined, other things have declined with it. Um, it also is the absolute best plant for stream bank stabilization, but water filtration. It does the best job in cleaning up nitrates and phosphates. And so we do our part to plant that a lot. Uh, we work with uh, uh, butternut uh, quite a bit. Um, that's another one that's on the decline due to a blight, much like the chestnut. Uh, we work with our ramps a lot. Um, it's just one of those things as TV shows encourage kind of harvesting and unsustainable mm -hmm. methods to make money. It's something that's, that's declined a lot and we're starting to see it on tribal lands because people are invading in order to dig. Um, and of course the American chestnut. Um, I can't pretty, I mean I'm sure we can all talk about how important the American chestnut is historically. Uh, but we just signed a, mem a memorandum of agreement with the American Chestnut Foundation to actually start planting chestnuts on tribal land. So, really exciting project. And um, you know, I know I'm supposed to be talking about agriculture, but all these things play back into agriculture. Like our farmers traditionally wanted river cane next to their fields to stop the runoff and erosion and to keep the water clean. Uh, you're going to see tobacco growing around all our fields. Uh, it's a, and, you know, you're going to see hickories and ramps and chestnuts in the forest. And as I mentioned, we farm the forest. That's just as important to us as going out in the field and growing corn. And so I talk about those things a lot because this time of the year, if you're at home, you're eating a lot of these things. Excuse me. Yes. How tall do the trees have to be to So river cane is a very interesting, I can nerd out, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, river cane is a plant that we, we really don't know anything about we, as far as, um, river cane research started in the year 2000. It's a very, very short time to know anything about a plant in terms of looking at other plant materials. We have no idea what makes that plant go to flower. We have no idea what makes that plant seed actually viable seed. Just because it flowers doesn't mean it's going to seed. And if it does seed, it might not be viable. Um, it's very common to be at home to be looking at a cane break, and you'll just see a bunch of it brown. Um, when a cane break goes to seed and to flower, it, it dies. So when you see a big dead patch like that um, anywhere, that's one plant. That's a rhizome that might have been 100 yards long. And so it's really hard to, uh, we're trying to monitor those cane breaks and we're trying to map them so we know, so we're on a consistent basis going around. Uh, because there's really no true way to sustainably propagate river cane. Because the seed's just so hard to get. If you can get it, it's fine. but. Uh, the chances of you getting river cane seed to grow it out is nearly impossible. And so I'm proud to say that we beat Auburn and Mississippi State in uh, river cane production. They had a 99% mortality rate, and I had like a 54, so. 
<laughs> it's like this plant right here. This is river cane, and the way that we grew that is we do native plant rescue. That's what we do. And when I see a development going on, um, I stop and talk to people. I don't care. I'm crazy. And I'm like, what are you going to do with that river cane? If they say they're going to get rid of it, I'll bring my crew down there and we'll take as much of it as we can and we'll relocate it somewhere um, or pick up rhizomes and lay them down in pots or in the ground. And, and grow them out for that purpose. Uh, so, you know, I think you saw how hard it is to find that plant online. If you did, it was probably $400 for that pot. Well, I didn't find it. So. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> there's a lot of those around here. Is there? Yeah, down, you know, growing down Muddy Creek on both sides. Early settlers used, used it for cattle feed. Yeah, that was one of the big declines. It's very, very nutritious in terms of uh, uh, having a lot of protein and and uh, that was the, as, as westward expansion took place, they grazed cattle and cane rakes really, really heavily. There's even, there's even stories in the archives historically of that, that the rhizome being dried and pounded into a flower and eaten. Um, so it had a lot of value historically, but I'm gonna nerd out about river cane. <laughs> um, so I, I put this slide in here. I like to look at pictures and I like y'all to kind of imagine what what I'm seeing, and, and um, I just this is some of the seed bank things that we grew this year. And um, here in the top right corner, that's Mr. Will Tushka. Uh, he's one of my technicians. And does anybody know what he's standing beside? What he's what he, what, he, what he's got in the UTV there? Wash. Wash. There's wash. <laughs> Those are candy roasters. Uh, very, very important food source. Um, I've had candy roasters last underneath my sink for like 10 months. So you can imagine, very thick, hard skin. But you can imagine why these were so important historically as this winter storage food. And I mean, they're so sweet, they make the best pies. You can roast them, you make soup with them. And they're, they're huge. And so a lot of food there. Um, this is some of the seed. As you look in the middle there in the basket, and to my hand to the left, that's some of our traditional butter bean, actually. Um, that picture was taken at the Cherokee Indian Fair in 2019. Um, at the fair in the exhibit hall, we have an agricultural section where people from, well, from three years old to 100 years old enter different agricultural goods, and they're, they're, there's different categories, but uh, this was one of some of Roy Lambert's um, he's a tribal elder who donated a lot of seed back into the seed bank. Um, but, uh, this is one of his last entries. He said that he probably wouldn't be able to do this anymore. So I just thought he saw what a beautiful thing. Uh, down in the bottom left, that's uh, Trail of Tear Bean. And that bean actually was extinct in North Carolina. Um, we lost it completely. It made its way to Oklahoma, and uh, it found its way home. And so. Uh, I was given 20 when I started, and we probably have around 10,000 now, and we're still getting up the, the quantities and the population that we want to donate back to the community. So every every spring, we do a seed kit giveaway sponsored by the Chief's Office, and uh, that's the goal of all these things that we're seed making, is that they get put back into the community's hands and they're being grown out. Um, here in the bottom, Middle, that's some of our traditional flower corns. And so, this is actually yellow and white, but it's the same kind of corn. This corn is so hard that when it's ground, it just turns to flour. There's no grit. Um, it's the basis for all of our Cherokee bread, so bean bread, live dumpling, um, uh, chestnut bread, sweet potato bread, any of those. You gotta have this corn. You gotta have that corn uh, in order to, to have those things. And so that's some of um, a tribal elder who passed away when I was in high school in 2009, named Walker Calhoun. Uh, that's some of his collection that he donated to the tribe before he passed away. Uh, Walker was a fluent speaker and a traditionalist, and um, it's it's really kind of 
it's hard feeling for me because I grew up knowing who Walker was and looking up to him. But this year, Walker's great grandson, who he never met, is my intern. And he's growing this flower corn this year. And um, his whole project that he's going to be doing for the tribe is going to be, he's going to be the youngest hominy maker by the time he's done. Um, but he's growing his great-grandfather's flower corn, and, and that's what he's going to be used to. So, uh, does anybody know what this, this is here, the bottom right? Well, Are they? it is. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> tears. We call them corn beads. Um, I said earlier over at the garden that I don't really like to put kind of culturally significant labels on certain things, like based on times and when they came in, because this is a non-native plant. This is Asian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it was brought here and. It became a very, very popular decorative item that you find grown mm -hmm. in Cherokee. It's, it's, it's something that people want. It's been a source of income for people. A lot of people bead with it. And um, we, we, it's not invasive. Uh, it stays where it's at. But uh, we grow out a lot of that from collections that people have donated. But uh, there's a lot of stories that revolve around when Judge Tears came, or corn beads, and how they made their way to Oklahoma with them. So I always throw that one in there. Oh. Yes, sir. I, I'm, a, I'm a little puzzled here. Um, how do you pinpoint these particular things as being culturally significant? Do you interview? Are they still being used actively? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So mm -hmm. you go talk to the cooks and say, what, what are you well, doing? I mean, we're a population of 16,000. Most of us are related, but we grew up eating these things. And so these things have already been important. They've been archived and been important. There's not something that's necessarily uncommon, per se, uh, but they could surely, but hopefully, not be lost, too. And so like the Trail of Tear Bean, there's records of that bean from our own people in the 1820s, and then it disappeared. Mm -hmm. They talk about the look of it, the color of it, it's written, um, but it went to Oklahoma. And so mm -hmm. when they got to Oklahoma, um, years and years and years later, they rediscovered that bean. Um, it's hard to kind of explain the traditional ecological knowledge side because they, it's not something that we share a whole lot of, but for example, there's people in Oklahoma who have never been to Western North Carolina, and they know everything about some of the places there. They've heard stories their whole lives of like, I know I'm a Cowie Mound because of this mountain, this mountain, this mountain, and the way the sun's rising, okay. and things like that. So it's a mix of a lot of things, but when it comes to some stuff, I'm community surveying a lot. I'm talking to people. What are we missing? What do we need? Um, what are you all seeing? Can I help you with this? And so it's, it's, a, it's a very unique mix of how I pick and choose what I grow. Now, is there a, is there a traditional way of farming? And yeah, absolutely. Are you replicating this or how it works? Well, you know what this is? Back before steel and iron made its way here, this was a planting stick. I'm not exactly done with it yet. I just started carving it every COVID because I have nothing going on. But this is what a planting stick looked like. Okay. And so when we think 200 years ago, we'll just say 200 years ago, we didn't have all these invasive species, right? There was stuff, stuff starting to come in. Um, but it wasn't as hard. It was certainly hard to farm. But now if I was to go out and burn a field, I would probably have a Johnson grass field by the end of it because Johnson grass is an invasive species that's taken over. Fire stimulates grass. Um, I probably couldn't do that, but fire is a historic method of, um, of that was used in farming in the forest and in the field. Now, I guess the important, you know, like I said earlier, you hear these words permaculture and forest farming and these things that are just kind of fabby that it's just a way of life at home, but compost even. 
we didn't know what phone post was, but we were, but if you look into the archaeological surveys and the historical documents, they were composting. We find them when we do archaeological digs and surveys, you find compost pits, mussel shells, fish bones, anything that they weren't using, they had pits, burn pits, they would burn it, they would reapply it to the fields. Um, you know, you hear a lot about Three Sisters gardening or farming. Um, not a historic practice by Cherokees necessarily. Um, it was done in a large scale setting, um, but it wouldn't have been in a mound setting like everybody imagines. That was a very northeast practice, but you would have seen a corn, a, a massive cornfield that had beans intertwined with it and probably pumpkins on the edge. Um, so there is a lot of historical, and even up until the Ag Census of 1835, uh, the Cherokee Nation at the time was, was very far ahead of, of even Europeans in terms of farming. We had plows, we had horses, we had cattle. Um, and in those, in those records you see, like I mentioned earlier at the garden, peach trees, apple trees, apiaries, they, they, these people recorded everything. Um, and you can almost, well, I'll just say it straight up, uh, Cherokee records are better than anything the U.S. ever kept. You can find anything that's through Cherokees. They kept records of everything. And so even when they got to Oklahoma, people remembered what they left behind and they made claims to the government to say, you owe me for this. Because I mentioned over at the garden, uh, going to Oklahoma obviously was horrible, and, and, um, but these people never forgot what they left behind. And if you look historically, as westward expansion and manifest destiny was taking place, Cherokees and Creeks in the south were keeping established orchards that white people weren't, or anybody for that matter, I shouldn't say it's white people, but um, that's, that was where some of the most famous nurserymen of the south, Fruitlands, um, uh, Silas McDowell, this is where those guys came after removal to find the genetics that they wanted to start their nurseries with. We're probably all eating Cherokee apples um, historically. And so we know some of those uh, apples, like the Junaluska, the, the uh, Beecher, the uh, Nickajack, some of these things that have historical connections. Um, it's, it's really interesting, because I said, because people like Junaluska, he went to Oklahoma and came back as an old man, and he went straight to where his apple tree was. Like that was one of the things that he recorded, documented, and knew he wanted to be paid for was his favorite apple tree. And even as an old man, he knew how to find it when he came home. So uh, I'm gonna start rambling. I'm not careful. <laughs> so, so where are all these documents? Yeah. We have a well. Obviously, we have a very successful museum, um, but we have the. National Ag Library, which is a pretty good resource, but we have a Tribal Historic Preservation Office mm -hmm. um, that's as good as anything you can find. So records are everywhere. You can find things online. You guys want to? Sorry, don't let me just talk everything. <laughs> I see this stuff every day. I noticed some of your photographs of your modern farming. You have raised beds. Is that historically accurate, or is that just what you're doing? Depending on the soil type. So. Uh, you, you're, there, there's records, like I said, of adding compost in. And, and now today, you have to think that the Eastern Band is left on 56,000 acres. That's what the tribe has in possession today. Historically, the tribe had land in seven states. So you think about the diversity and the ranges of what we had. Now, today, we're in the high mountains. Um, and so some places are... Um, you know, very clay-based, and the only way that they can get anything to grow is to terrace and amend and raise beds to get good drainage and get fertile soil, things of that nature. So things have always changed and adjusted, but historically there was no worries about how really having to raise a bed because we had lush river bottoms. I picked this guy this morning. <laughs> this is a Cherokee tan, actually, and this is another crop that was lost to Cherokees in North Carolina. And in Kevin Welch's journeys to Oklahoma, um, 
this is one of the things that he picked up and brought back. This is something that made it to Oklahoma that was extinct in North Carolina, but it's, it's a great little personal sized pumpkin. They get bigger than that, but um, they're very heavy. Uh, they're not great pies. Uh, they're very vigorous vines. They, they produce really heavily. Uh, they don't have a lot of insect pressure. Um, but I grow those a lot. Uh, something we're trying to get back into the, um, in the community's hands. Uh, let's see here. So passing these guys around, these are some plant tags. And um, we've been trying to develop several different botanical trails for the last few years uh, with these signs. And the reason being is because our speakers, our speakers are getting older. They're, they're getting their elders. And we have a lot of speakers who are raising grandchildren great-grandchildren and, and um, it's not easy for some of these people to access the rugged landscape of West North Carolina anymore to get out in the woods and find these things and to be able to teach mm -hmm. and so this is some of the plant tags that we've been developing to put on um, a botanical trail so that someone can easily go out take their grandkids they can walk out a trail and they can say this is what this is See, and on these, on this, we have the Cherokee name. So uh, that's the phonetics on the bottom, but that's the syllabary on top. And so then we have the botanical name, the Latin name, and then we have the common name, Ramps. I think we talked about common names over at the garden with yeah. Uber on there. Uh, but uh, you know, Wasti, 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 So Chana, So Chana. Um, but, Tala, but it's a, uh, this is an easy way to save language, but also to teach culturally important and significant plants to younger people. Uh, our casino is, is very active in supporting our efforts to make sure that we have these areas. And our casinos have a very, very beautiful landscape. Um, they do an excellent job, and they've been willing to let us do installations of native plants on the property where they can't traditionally have flower beds or something, and that they're having the weed eat, they'll let us come in and put it back in a native plant. And so, um, this is so chancy. It's very high tech in my plastic bag there. My, my it's the same technology we use here at the museum. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I always love this picture because right behind me <laughs> is a canona. Yeah. A canona. Because in the other parts of the best yeah. there, yeah. She's grinding corn there. She's grinding nuts, one. I can't tell. But uh, it would have been this kind of corn like this. Um, she might have been mashing hickory nuts. Could have been mashing chestnuts. But you see down below, I know it doesn't look too appetizing, but does anybody know what that's called? That's a delicacy this time of the year if you can get it, but uh, it's kanunchi. And uh, it's a sweet drink or sweet dessert, but it's uh, it's corn. It's 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 dry hominy, and it's mashed, but it's it's got chestnut, walnut, or hickory nuts, and the nuts are beat until they melt. And if anybody's ever had nut milk, um, that's what makes it sticky, and you can you can preserve those and keep them, and uh, they get pulled out on special retreat or on special occasions as treats, and they just put them in water, light water, cook them down, and then you just sit and sip them and drink them. But turkeys uh, uh, in Oklahoma, they add a lot of sugar to them for some reason, but uh, they got more diabetes than us. <laughs> but they, um, but it's really really delicious. Um, oh, sorry. We're going to play a game here in a minute. It's called Name That Plant. <laughs> People who had to pull out their phones to identify. Or like uh, but, I, I, you know, having a Pinona like that is something that is such an important part of history. And, and we've got less and less people who have them, and less and less people even know what they are, much less. And so, but that's something that people used to see all the time on porches and 
I've got one. I just always put that picture up there because I want to want people to know what they are and bring them back to life. But uh, this picture is in the middle of here on the far, well, not on the far right, but second to the right. Those young men are, um, that's part of the Burnt Town Indian Ball team. And um, they're making stickball sticks out of hickory. And so I forgot to bring ball, well, there's ball sticks there, but yeah. <laughs> it, was out, it was out west style. Yeah, uh, yeah. These guys, <laughs> yeah, uh, they don't play good ball down there. Our sticks, you see where this guy ends right yeah. here. Um, Cherokee sticks historically go all the way down to double handle. Mm -hmm. and, and they're beat together. Um, and they're, they're thicker and they don't break. But uh, that's a uh, high bird from the snowbird community sitting in the middle carving, and everybody's watching, but uh, uh, he's teaching them how to make ball sticks. But how that comes into play of agriculture is because we need hickory to make ball sticks, but we also need hickory for the nuts, for the wildlife value, for the ecological value. And so this year, the ball teams took it upon themselves, which is kind of unheard of to have Birdtown, Wolftown, Big Cove, some of these folks all together in agreements, but every year they're going to go into their communities and plant at least 30 hickories to start replenishing. So in 15 years, they might take five for sticks and leave the rest and, or, or whatever. So, um, but that's a, this picture, it's always good pictures to put in there. And then um, this is just some, some flyers that we used to have put up talking about uh, agriculture and Cherokee for kids and, you know, where I said some things were introduced by Europeans, but some things are found in the wild. And, um, some things are part of Native American culture for thousands of years. And it looks like greasy greens there, and we're good. Is there a lot in there? Yeah. Um, there's, there's, there's historic connections of Cherokees and watermelons and the mountain sweet. So, one of the services that are our program, Ag and Natural Resources, offers to the community is land that the tribe owns that is designated farmland, we lease out free of charge to enrolled members to farm on. They could be on an eighth of an acre, they could be on 50, 60 acres. Um, we have about 50 individual members who have uh, leases, except very different sizes. Uh, the top left, though, is a picture. That, that's a pretty, that's a pretty common spring garden or field in Cherokee. Um, lots of greens, some onions, probably some potatoes coming up. Uh, that's Mr. John Dugan's lease. Um, he does a really excellent job, and he does a good job mentoring young folk uh, that are interested in farming. But that, that's at Gadua, um, where this is located. This sign is the entrance, and so that's where I said the mother town of all Cherokees. Um, in the middle there, what do we got? We talked about it a lot earlier. Exactly. Um, like I said, when you get three uh, tribal elders in a week telling you they can't find all the strawberries, it's probably something you should be growing for the community. So um, we go out, we do quite a bit of um, plant inventory and uh, looking at populations, we have a tribal forester who spends his time in the in the forest a lot. Um, we survey for these things and we look for them. And so I miss some wild strawberries at home. How about in the bottom left corner? Corn. Dang, who else from the south here? Tommy. 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 Yeah. Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's Tommy. 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 Hominy grits? No, just not grit. Just, that's flower hominy. Um, but that's doesn't look too appetizing there. But that's where the that's where the lie's been added, and um, you can start seeing the color in the corner. It's turning orange. They, they call it skint corn a lot of times. I don't really call it hominy, but um, that's that's when the lie, the the acid from the hickory ash, is is getting that skin to remove the hard out, out epidermal layer of the corn to make it soft and make hominy, but that's the process. Um, and once again, you have to have hickory ash to 
made comedy. Um, what does the farming of the forest look like? I don't mean to ask about traditional ecological knowledge. Oh, no, 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 absolutely not. Um, it's, it's a lot of a lot of controlled planting, just like you would imagine an orchard style planting. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's very common to find groves of certain things, but you also find you know, groves of ramps, mm -hmm. certain climatic environmental factors that come into place. Um, but it's, it's a lot of management, it's a lot of forest floor cleaning. Um, you might see some burning off. You, you see a lot of people adding and planting in there, just like an orchard type setting. I notice that soil is dark, sort of Midwestern dark, as opposed to Carolina red. Mm -hmm. Is that an old field, or is that hard to keep uh, it up? That's just really, I guess, historically, when you think about how old the Appalachian Mountains are, that's probably a million years of natural erosion of mountaintop getting into the river bottom. Um, but it's you now, like I said, that's that's the first village site. That's the mother town. That spot was picked for a reason, and it could have been for the soil and the water that was there. I mean, this fertile bottoms. Anybody know what this one is? <coughs> Not, bottom, right? not Job's tears again. <laughs> <laughs> that's blood root. Yeah. Um, that's, that's one of our important artisan plants. That uh, um, There's big money in digging artisan resources and selling it. And uh, that's what we're trying to get away from. We're trying to get it to where the populations are so high that uh, we don't have to worry about people going in and pillaging our natural resources for money. And so we, we do, that's one of the plants that you would typically buy at a grocery store. How do the wild strawberries differ from the type that you generally get at a grocery store? Very, 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 very smaller. Um, Does it taste about the same? See, a thousand a pint is what Thomas Jefferson referred to them as. They would take a thousand to fill a pint. Uh, the taste is fantastic, um, but they're very small. Um, I don't know if anybody else has ever noticed this, picking wild strawberries, but I always get in a yellow jacket's nest every time I get around wild strawberry patch. I don't know if I'm just attracted to the yellow jackets, but I find them. Um, but wild strawberries are, are certainly delicious. And, um, going back to Thomas Jefferson, he's actually one of the only people who ever recorded and took data and record of wild strawberries. And um, I actually got seed from his Monticello collection. Uh, the same seed that's been grown out in the trial gardens there is, is what I used to grow some of our plants with. But, uh, Another one of those cool things, though, that we get to work with as a tribe that there's never been any research done on. We get to mess with things and look at things and observe and do things that the university should be doing, but we're doing. So, I love this menu so much. I, I use this picture all the time, but 1949, Cherokee Indian Feast. Look at the food options that are on there. When I look at that list, that list actually hangs behind my desk because I turn around and reference it a lot. And so right there is one of those examples that we were talking about. How do I pick what I'm growing or how do I know? 1949, these were common. And um, it's actually pretty po uh, common to, to find these things today at our fair. Um, and so when I look at this list though I think about how can my program make these things come back or be more popular or be more prevalent or how do I make sure that these foods always exist in the community and so I mean it's that time of the year out now for uh, sassafras tea and spicewood tea uh, the ball players drink sassafras a lot um, anybody who uh, may have an uh, alcohol craving, sassafras is, is, is good for your stomach. It's uh, good to help you fight off the urge to drink. Um, but I love that picture. Who knows what we got in the middle there? Ground nut? Ground nut. Or wild tater. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, you know, wild potato, going back to foods and agriculture, there's a wild potato plant. Mm -hmm. There used to be a mulberry plant. There used to be all these foods, 
all this agricultural knowledge, all these things were connected in so many different ways. So wild potato clam, we grow those in raised beds, they're easy to get up. Um, another thing that there's not ever been a lot of research done on, uh, I've, I've got kind of the first record of that I found that's reliable for about every ounce of ground nut that I put in, um, I get back about a pound in return. So 16 to 1 is not bad. And if you've never had one, they are absolutely delicious. Uh, they're very earthy. They're um, kind of creamy though. They're, you can fry them, mash them, boil them just like a normal potato. Uh, they're, but they're awesome. Uh, a lot of, uh, it's becoming, some of these foods are becoming very hip in like the Asheville scene. Uh, everything's hip in Asheville, right? uh, but, Is there a uh, restaurant in Asheville that has... I think so. Um, there's, a, there's a farmer in South Carolina who I think sells wild potatoes to a, a restaurant, but it's probably on my price range. <laughs> I heard plants for a little and I can't go to Asheville much. But, uh, so are they uh, like starchy tubers, like yeah. a conventional potato? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the far left there, oh, it breaks my heart to see that picture, but um, I got a call from Warren Wilson College. Does mm -hmm. everybody know where Warren Wilson is? Mm -hmm. it absolutely blew my mind. Um, Warren Wilson said, hey, we uh, got money to do a stream remediation project, but uh, in order to do this project, we have to take out River Chain. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, Adam Griffith, who's now the director of RT Car, myself and my employees, um, and, and actually uh, Eddie Bushyhead and his boy Ty, uh, he's a flute maker, we all went and uh, we got to Warren Wilson and we were just amazed at the amount of river cane that was being taken out. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did our best to, to talk them out of it, and they did. Uh, they ended up not taking out as much, but uh, they still had to get rid of some, and uh, that's some of the cane that we saved and brought back to be replanted in other places. And so, uh, always, but, but that's on their farm. What an important plant to have on your farm. I don't know who said this, <laughs> but an old saying that no self-respect in Cherokee would ever be found about a corn patch. Um, and if you, if you drive around the fall boundary today, You'll, you'll see a corn patch in about every yard. I mean, even if it's small, even if it's the size of the tables, you're going to see corn. But uh, uh, Pat Wynn from the Cherokee Nation uses that quote a lot in his talks. And uh, I always said, i, I got to use that. <laughs> but, um, I think that's about all I've got, guys. Um, I've actually, who wants to come try to identify plants? <laughs> Sakina does. <laughs> Myself. We know that one's um, River Cane. <laughs> uh, no, there's, there's five plants here and there's four tags. Oh, yeah. okay. You gotta, you gotta try to figure them out. So yeah, this is uh, one of our traditional beans here. Uh, October beans, speckled beans. Dried. These are Dutch Fork pumpkin seeds. Um, there was a town in upstate South Carolina that was referred to as Pumpkin Town, E. Young. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. David Chills from the University of South Carolina rediscovered this seed from a farmer there and sent me 10 seed. And we've mm -hmm. been growing it out since. Yeah. Uh, this is a corn that I don't know a whole lot about, but um, Deb Panther from the Big Cove community this was her mother's, and she used to make gritted bread with it. And there's two different kinds, and she would plant them, obviously, so they wouldn't cross-pollinate. She, she gave me this corn to grow out this year, so next year i got to find a patch to, to plant that corn. Beautiful. This is kind of what our meals look like. I'm not sharing it. <laughs>
Here's your pumpkin. All right. So, lots of things in this. These are some things that we want to start doing more of. These were actually conducted by the Cherokee Nation um, and translated, but one copy is completely in Cherokee. The other copy got part Cherokee, mostly English. Um, uh, I, I don't want to read that part to you. Cherokee is a very descriptive language, and when you think of blood root, like, I just have to open it for the We want to start doing like 12, 15 plants a year, highlighting them, having them out. Um, but these are examples of what we're going to work on. There are a lot of bad books out there about Native Americans in general, but there are a lot of bad books about Cherokees. A lot of misinformation. Um, but this is actually a pretty good Cherokee plants book. Um, uh, Mary Chilkowski, she's an enrolled member, she worked on this. And, um, if you're going to buy a Cherokee plant book, it's kind of hard to read. This is, <laughs> this is the one. But when you look, the reason I say there's a lot of bad books is some things just ain't shared. And um, Cherokee people are funny. Like, they, if they're not picking on you, like, they don't like you. Uh, like, you need to be worried if they're not making fun of you in some way. And so, even in, like, uh, James Mooney's books, they purposely gave him things out of order so they would be look funny. When, but if he was to read it to another Cherokee, they would laugh because they'd say they gave it to him in the wrong order. Like, that's funny. It didn't make sense. So, like, uh, but the pranksters. But um, Roots of Our Renewal is a book. Uh, on ethnobotany and Cherokee environmental governments. And uh, Dr. Clint Carroll, I think of Colorado State, is a member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, wrote this book. And um, it's pretty good. Um, it's, it's, it's much more um, from, the, from the view of Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma than, than the Eastern man. But it's a very good read if anybody's ever interested in it. Um, Clint, Dr. Carroll, has done some excellent work in the Cherokee Nation with with agriculture and plants, and so um, this is what we refer to a lot as one of our governing documents of our program. It's an integrated resource management plan. It's um, it's really called the legacy plan. And in this document, we're about to redo it this year. It highlights watershed, um, Cherokee zones of influence, natural and man-made systems, air. Fish and wildlife, forest, agriculture, agro recreation, all these resources that we manage in our program, this is our governing document that helps us do that. And so, um, let's see. David, one of the things you should do is put up the natural resource website. If nobody's oh, yeah. ever been oh, to yeah, it, do that. it is fantastic. That's how I found you. <laughs> <laughs> On that we have a website. <laughs> you have a fantastic <laughs> website. <laughs> uh, but this section is on agriculture, and here's a, here's a quote by Kevin, you know, we are an agriculture people. Our ancestors farmed. We grew corn, squashes, beans, strawberries, and other plants. Other tribes identify themselves as horse people, or buffalo people, or salmon people. The Cherokee, we are an agriculture people. And that's coming from Kevin, but um, there's just, this is a, I always refer back to this when I'm trying to plan my work and how I'm going to serve the community, because that's my job is to serve the community to the best of my capacity. And so when you, but when I look through this document and I look at what their goals were, 10-year um, management goals, um, develop viable farmer's market, make it possible for grocers to carry local foods. They wanted to preserve and protect meals. They wanted to actively implement conservation and weed management plans. They wanted to get rid of the invasives. They wanted to take action to increase tribal farmland holdings by 100 acres in the next five years. That was so important to them to start buying back some of these uh, agricultural farmlands. But um, This is on our website as well. How'd you do this again? <laughs> Thank you. 
Did you know I tried. Oh, uh, you actually got them all. <laughs> <laughs> I put the wrong tag up. This is chestnut. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> chestnut, persimmon, elderberry. This is a. Uh, it's actually a mocker nut. That's mocker nut. This is elderberry. This is mulberry. So all these things that we grow in our, our nursery. Uh, just been looking at my notes. <laughs> Oh, it's going to open my email if you oh. open it. Let me. <laughs> Baskets being woven so tight that they would hold water for free retaining. People were so, were so used to that. Does each uh, artist have their own signature style in the way they weave? Yes and no. Um, it's uh, certain people learn from each other or certain styles, like there's there's double wall, double woven baskets, there's single weaves, these are all double woven. Um, but there's certain patterns that sometimes you, you find between artisans, um, mm -hmm. just m much like pottery. Mm -hmm. So this is on our website. I don't, I'm not actually not been on here in a while. Oh, so this is kind of a decent little video here of an overview of the Division of Ag and Natural Resources, you get to see my other mug. The best fish and wildlife staff in the southeast working for the tribe. They're, they're excellent. Thank you. 
finish those food commissions, clean up the artists and resources, meet the labs, build farmers, build the monarchs, pollinators. And today we have an event to donate hickory trees to all the stick mark in the community so that they can plant them. So 10, 15 years down the road, they have trees to harvest for sticks, but also for the food source, for baskets, um, for the wildlife, and just uh, to be good stewards of the land and do our part and replenish the super tree that's coming a little ready to find. My name is Derek Cochran. I was with the Eastern Red and Turkey Indians with And our responsibilities are erosion control, monitoring stream of wetland impact, we monitor your private projects like the one behind me. Any possession holding projects we monitor. We're responsible for uh, monitoring and uh, inspecting the underground force tanks on top of grounds. Our office is also responsible for a US EPA brownfield grant. This project specifically is probably one of the bigger projects that really encompasses everything our office does all at once. So it, it's one of the Hello, my name is Katie Tyler, and I'm the Air Cargo Program Supervisor for the East Savannah Cherokee Indians. The tribe has been monitoring ambient air quality since 1999, and I have been a part of it since 2008. Our primary goal is to monitor for ozone and PM2.5 for compliance with the National Ambient Air Quality Program. We also do various annual projects depending on the community needs. Some of the past projects we have done include installation of a biodiesel production facility in where all the biodiesel produced is used in our school buses, installation of a solar PV, solar hot water, and wind turbines at the Cherokee Visitor Center as an alternative energy demonstration project. We've also distributed 100 Healthy Homes toolkits to the community. We distributed Laid on Test Kits to the community. And we are also a part of the Wisdom Program in the Maritime Some of the current projects that we are working on are the addition of the air pointer system to our ambient monitoring network. This system consists of federally equivalent methods of monitoring for ozone and PM2.5 along with a neurological RMM sensor. The air pointer system is on the trailer so it can easily be moved. Currently, it is at our high elevation monitoring site. The neat thing about the air pointer system is that it has everything that a traditional monitoring site has, but at a fraction of the footprint and it's portable. We also received a grant to replace one of our diesel school buses with an electric school bus and the charging infrastructure. And finally, our mobile smoke monitoring system. This system is going to be used for prescribed burns and wildfire events. The system is capable of monitoring for ozone, PM2.5, and 10 nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen oxide, says a lot because our casinos are our number one revenue source. They fund everything the tribe does. All the services, all the happenings, uh, but our program makes the second most money. And we're really proud of that. Um, we're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to, to make money in our fishing programs. We're trying to build a new fish hatchery uh, to start doing more processing to be able to sell the trout that we grow. Um, but we're also going to expand into, if you guys haven't heard, marijuana. Um, so that's going to be a big one for us. Uh, 
We're also gonna, we're gonna expand in a lot of different areas. So as 30 employees, I mean, the tribe is probably the biggest employer in Western North Carolina. We bring employees from all over. Um, and so I think that's a, a, a big point in the fact that agriculture and natural resources is that important to the ABCI that we're gonna continue to, to support and grow these programs. One last video, this is what I actually wanted to watch. Okay. We can ask questions and talk at the same time. So when we talk about Sochan, Mr. Tommy Cave, who is our tribal forest, we talked about farming in the forest. Oh, she's gone. Uh, they're sustainably harvesting plants, right? The, the Cherokee method of harvesting is sustainable, uh, but unfortunately, Cherokees have had to prove that to the government to regain access into traditional homelands to get food. So uh, we had some tribal elderly ladies who um, were picking this native green in the car and um, were ticketed for harvesting this green. And um, we kind of sparked this whole big project uh, that said, okay, we need to take a stance and we need to we need to prove that we're stewards of the land, that the way that these ladies were harvesting caused no impact to the national forest landscape whatsoever. So Mr. Tommy Cave, in a conjunction with Michelle Baumfleck and, and Joanne McCoy from the Arboretum and U.S. Forest Service worked on this uh, research project for four years, I think, um, or maybe longer, uh, with Sochan, which is the green-headed cornflower, if, if you don't use the Cherokee name. Um, but what it showed was is that the Cherokee method of harvesting actually increased populations of plants where they had been harvested because the way of harvesting increased seed production. Um, we weren't going in, these ladies weren't going in and cutting things to the ground. They weren't digging ramps. They weren't, they weren't doing anything that caused an ecological impact. But the tribe fronted the bill, bill hundred thousands of dollars to prove that we knew what we were doing and so um, we were I think the first tribe to take advantage of that and we regained access to the park service landscape to uh, harvest Sochan and that was just the door like we did that plant it's just uh, just to get the door open and now that we're in we're just going to keep going and keep we're just going to keep proving that we're stewards of the land and that we're not causing any more impact in the national park already does themselves. Views of the woods that could be nice to the Cherokee tribe or part of their neighborhood. It has to do with roads and the very smoky mountains that block the picking of plants tonight on the 11th. News 13's Rex Hodge introduced us to Sochan and the fight to get it. Sochan, where are you at? The tribe's Secretary of Agriculture and Forest Resources Specialist. Check out a Sochan patch in Cherokee. It's been provided for us for thousands of years. Jerry Al and Tommy Cave say Sochan is seated in Cherokee history. That's our Cherokee name for the green light company. A traditional source of food, high mineral content, and we see much of the care spinach. Much of it grows in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. The park fell home there for a while. Federal regulations prohibit the removal of plants from national parks, but a modification by the Park Service last year allows federally recognized tribes to seek an agreement to gather plants from parks for traditional purposes. A new agreement between the park and the Eastern Band. That's a good example of former sports park. To sustainably harvest yeah. Sochan from park land. And in such a way that both honors their tradition, that protects those plants long term. The first step requires an independent environmental assessment. You do have to have a plan and no significant impact to then complete those next steps. When you take off the tent, you're leaving some day. Out in the cave say the Cherokee method of harvesting Sochan causes no harm. This is an opportunity for us now to be able to leverage our tradition as far as the knowledge with Western science to prove that these methods that we've been doing for millennia are more sustainable. The way we harvest it increases seed production. The assessment at a cost of $68,000 to the tribe is underway, expected to be done in the middle of next year. Cave expects a positive finding. Next year, he says, any foraging for social that are part by the tribe will be controlled amount, when, and where. There'll be a permitting holding uh, crop system. The size still here, it's now it's looking at how to manage that, how we're going to access it from an eastern man standpoint. The agreement requires only local consumption of the plant, no commercial use of plant that we have to serve this, you know, these types of resources in our school cafeteria. An agreement over Sochi 
that could nurture the interests of both the park and the tribe. I know it's also that we can enter into this agreement in a way that allows us to honor that tradition and also continue to protect that population for them. We've been here, we're always going to be here, and this is something that is an investment for our future and hopefully we're kind of building a culture in Cherokee, Rock Island, Route 13. But I thought that was a good thing that Holly said right there, is that it's an investment into our future. And that's how Ag and Natural Resources is viewed from our leadership. And so um, with that, do we have any discussion points or are you talking to them? Yes, ma'am. Well, I think it is important that we have a good history and Certainly, we're, we've been certainly successful and blessed from um, endeavors. You know, I know up until about 2000, until the casinos started coming, um, we were in the same shape as North Dakota, South Dakota, anywhere else. We were um, maybe times were better and simpler then, but uh, the tribe has done an extremely good job in managing our resources and investing those monies um, that have been gained through gaming funds and the programs like this. So uh, we hope to continue to grow them and. and and uh, we hope to keep doing good work. So you're saying you think the casinos were... That helped the Eastern Band. Band. Absolutely helped the Eastern Band. Mm -hmm. um, of course, negatives come along with anything, uh, but the, the funds that we you know, use to pay for our programs and for travel budgets, mm -hmm. to employ people and to do projects, uh, they, they've certainly helped. It's just the imagination to put it all together with the Cherokee people. I mean, that's really people far superior. <laughs> <laughs> so, what population? What's the number of the population? Sixteen thousand. Roughly. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. You said you were going to go marijuana. Is that medical marijuana you're talking about? Well, it's a uh, stats. Um, yes, medical marijuana. No recreational. Not yet. Not in North Carolina yet. <laughs> I'm on the qual boundary. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> is that legal now? Medical is legal? is legal. Yes. David, I was just going to ask because you mentioned Nickajack. I grew up in Tennessee on the Nickajack uh, Lake on the Tennessee River. So I just oh, you, you mentioned it and it had to do with an apple, and I just wanted to ask you what that was about. Um, there's an apple called Nickajack that okay. um, has been traced back into having. Cherokee ties historically. Okay. Uh, doing some archive digging. Well, please uh, help me thank uh, Mr. Anderson for joining us tonight.